Good morning, church. You excited to be at church this morning? If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 17. We're going to jump right into it this morning as I only have about three hours of material to share with you this morning. So we're going to get after it this morning. Genesis chapter 17. Pastor Weaver, I thought he was getting up to leave. I thought he was like, three hours? I am out of here. I've sat through many of Pastor Weaver's long sermons, so he gets to sit through mine. Here we go. Genesis chapter 17. And if you're taking notes this morning, the title is this. Same story, new chapter. Same story, new chapter. I was trying to come up with something good, something exciting for you this morning as uh, my only thought for a, a title was just calling it Genesis chapter 17. But I thought, you know, we've been going through Genesis now for since October, uh, this is our fifth chapter now looking at the story of Abram and Sarai, and what do we find? It's the same story again, just a new chapter. So here we are, Genesis chapter 17, same story, new chapter. So a few weeks ago, we were introduced to Abram and Sarai, Abram and Sarai, and God speaks to Abram. He says, leave your country, leave your father's household, leave your people, and go to a place that I will show you. God is sending him out, and we see that God gives him a promise, really many promises. He says, I'm gonna bless you. I'm gonna make your name great. Basically, he's saying, I am going to make you famous. I am gonna give you children. Your, your descendants will outnumber the stars in the sky, the, the sand on the shore. That's how great your family is gonna be. I am gonna give you a family. Now, how many know that although God spoke this to him, there was a problem with the promise? God promises him, you're gonna have children, but there's a problem, and Abram looks at his life and he recognizes, I'm 75 years old. And he's 75 year olds in the room thinking like, this might be a good time in life to start a family. This is, this is, this is the time in my life to, no, probably not, but this is what God is calling him to. We see that he begins to follow where God's leading him to, but Abram has a problem with full obedience, as we've seen over the last couple weeks. He says, leave your father's household, he takes Lot with him. Lot was his nephew, he brings him along. He says, I'm gonna give you and Sarai a child. And obviously last week we jumped into the story of Hagar and we find out that they decided to take matters into their own hands. They're not fully obeying God, but what we see with partial obedience is that partial obedience really is what? Disobedience. He's disobeying God and what we find with disobedience is that disobedience always delivers drama. It always brings drama, and we see that there's drama that comes up with Lot. There's drama that comes up last week as it was like a, a episode of some reality TV show with Hagar and, and Sarah. It was this crazy story, but it's bringing drama. It is messy. And like I said, the, the title for today is same story, just a new chapter, and it feels like this story of Abram, we're just in this cycle of God speaks, and then Abram kind of obeys. God speaks, and then there's, it's like every week I feel like, all right, we're talking about disobedience again. All right, we're talking about disobedience again. And every week, he's in the same cycle, but what we're gonna see is that even though Abram gets in this same cycle, even though maybe you feel like you're in the same cycle of going through the same stuff over and over and over again, we serve a God who is still faithful. We serve a God who is full of grace, that, that no matter how far you run, no matter how many times you make mistakes, that he is so full of grace that he's got grace for you, that he is so faithful that no matter where you're at, he's gonna pull you back in. Anybody thankful in the 8.30 service this morning that we serve a God who is faithful? It's not about what I do. It's not about what I can come up with on my own. He is still good. He is still faithful, and we see we're gonna see this in Abram's life. So last week we ended with Abram having a son, with Hagar having Ishmael, and I wanna just start, we're gonna be in Genesis chapter 17, but if you have your Bible flip, uh, in, my, in my Bible it's one page back, if you're looking for this uh, Genesis, we're gonna start in Genesis chapter 16, verse 16, my Bible is page 17. Uh, if you can't find that, where Genesis chapter 16 is, you can go ahead and just close up your Bible and just follow along on the screen. We might be waiting all day. Genesis chapter 16, verse 16. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. 17.1. When Abram was 99 years old, pause. How old was he when Ishmael was born? 86 years old. Next verse. The very next verse. How old is he now? 
99 years old. So all the mathematicians in the room, 99 minus 86 equals 13. Some people had to really think about that. We'll pray for that later. 13, 13 years between one verse and the next verse. You might be going, well, that's a new chapter. It's, it's the very next verse, the, the very next thing that happens. 13 years have passed. 13 years since last week's episode of, of Hagar and Ishmael. 13 years. That means Ishmael is how old now? 13 years old. Imagine, some of you guys think raising teenagers is hard. He is 99 years old and just starting the teenage years with his kid. Praise God for Abram, right? God, God has a great sense of humor. Anybody ever noticed that before, right? So he's, he's 99 years old, 99. 13 years have passed since Ishmael was born. 13 years have passed since he decided he's gonna take matters into his own hands. 13 years that have gone on that I wonder if he's sitting there wondering, did I mess this up so far that God's not gonna remember the promise he gave me? Is this what my promise actually is just gonna be? 13 years of sitting in this, 13 years from last week to this week. 17, verse one, when Abram was 99, say 99, 99 years old, uh, when Hagar bore him Ishmael, or when Hagar bore him Ishmael, he was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said this, I am God Almighty, I am El Shaddai, walk before me faithfully and be blameless, then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. He says, I am God Almighty, which we know is I am El Shaddai. I am the all-sufficient one. I am the sustaining one. I am God Almighty. He comes to him at 99 years old and he reminds him right away. He tells him, this is the first time we see El Shaddai. We see that he tells him, I am God Almighty. I can do anything. There is no one, there is no thing, there is no diagnosis, there is no situation, there is nothing that can come before me. I am God Almighty. Someone in the room, your faith needs to, be, needs to rise up this morning and you need to be reminded that he is God Almighty. That he is the God of the impossible. That while we see what's possible, while we see what's logical, he says, you're 99 years old, I'm God Almighty, I'm gonna do what I can do. I'm gonna do what no man can do. I'm gonna do what nothing else can do. I am God Almighty. Someone in the room today, I hope that you're reminded that we serve a God who is God Almighty. We serve a God who can do all things. That maybe you're here today and, and you receive something, some news from a doctor. Maybe you're here today and you have a child, you have a grandchild who, who has run from God. They're far from God. Maybe you're here today and there's just some drama going on in your family. There's situations going on at work. We serve God Almighty who can do anything. He is God Almighty. He says, I am El Shaddai. Say El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. And he says, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. What does this look like to walk before God faithfully and to be blameless? I, I think faithfully this looks like this is we're consistent with God. It's constant. It's, it's continuous. We're always walking with God. Be blameless. This is the one that I had a harder time with because I don't know about you, you, you might read this and you say, be blameless, I'm a sinner. I can't be blameless, I'm gonna make mistakes over and over again. We see for Abram, this is conditional, that he's being blameless as he is being obedient to God, as he is walking with God. We see that in order to be blameless, this is the Old Testament, but when Jesus shows up in the New Testament, things begin to change, and we know that when we say yes to Jesus, we are justified. It's justification, just as if you've never sinned. So we say yes to Jesus, we evaluate, God, what is there in my life that needs to be removed? We ask him, he removes it, and we move from it. We're justified, we're made blameless. It's a consistent, it's a faithful walk with God. It's being blameless. He says, walk with me faithfully and be blameless. Verse three, Abram fell face down and said to him, as for me, and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you, you will be the father of many nations. Abram falls before God face down. Can I give you the secret to a faithful walk with God? It's personal worship of God. I wanna ask you a question and I want you to evaluate your life this morning. What does your worship to God look like? Now, Pastor Austin showed a video of revivals taking place that revivals are beginning and it's in all sorts of universities around our country. I wanna ask you a question if if you were in a moment where the presence of God was so strong, 
Are you in a place in your walk with God that you would sense that presence? Are you in a place where, like Abram, you would fall down face down? You know, as I've been preparing and as I've just been praying lately just for revival in our city, what I felt like God has been telling me is this, is that what we need to get back to as a church, as a, as a church as a whole, is remembering who God is, that God is so holy. He is so holy and he is so worthy that, that when we see him, it, our response is, I'm falling faith. I, I'm, I can't even Look at him, he is so good, he is so holy. Sometimes I feel bad for people who tell me, I just get tired of singing that same song over and over and over again, like that song just goes on forever, and I feel bad for those people because you know what the Bible says? That the angels are in heaven singing one song, holy, 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 over and over and over again. Can we as a people, can we as followers of Christ get back to that of recognizing that he is so holy? that he is so good and I am so bad, that, that he is so great and I am so little. Can we get to a place where we put ourselves down, where we lay ourselves down before God because he is so good and he is so great and he is so holy. We serve a God who is holy. We serve a God who, who is so much greater than we could ever think or imagine. We serve El Shaddai, God Almighty who can do all things. Abram falls face down before God. Let's be a people, let's be a church that is known for having reverence for God, for being in his presence. And, and I wanna be known that we're a church that when the presence of God, that I, I don't wanna ever get tired of being in the presence of God. I wanna have moments where it's like, uh, I've got these big important things to do, but you know what, forget those things. I'm in the presence of God, I'm staying right here. I don't need, I don't need lunch, this is everything I need. I don't need a nap, this is gonna give me the energy I need. He falls face down before God. God speaks to him, this is my covenant. What's a covenant? A covenant, it's an agreement between two people. It's, it's two parties agreeing that I'm gonna do this, you're gonna do this. It's, it's two parties coming to an agreement trying to reach the same conclusion. That it's a mutual agreement trying to find the same conclusion, a common goal. And we see that God says this is my covenant. Now this is a covenant. It says this is my covenant. This is showing us the relationship between God and Abram. That this is God's covenant. This is my covenant. And he's saying we're partners in this. Verse five, no longer will you be called Abram. Your new name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and your descendants after you for generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God. This is the covenant that God gives to Abram. He says, this is what I'm gonna do for you. I also love that in this verse that he renames him. He goes from Abram to what? Abraham. Abram, it means exalted father. Abraham, father of multitude. He's renaming him. I can only imagine that when now Abraham goes back to the camp and, and he's talking to everybody about what just happened between him and God that that he goes, also, God gave me a new name. I am now, you, you all can call me Abraham now. And people start to whisper, Abraham, father of multitude. Does he not remember that he is 99 years old? How is this? And I just imagine people start whispering and people start having their opinions about what he's saying. Can I tell you, I think too often that people's opinions and their comments prevent us from the promises of God. That God speaks something to you, God calls something to you, God gives you a promise, and maybe it's their opinions, maybe it's just our thought of what people's opinions and their comments are going to be. How many times are we prevented from, from seeing and walking in the promise of God because I'm so worried about what other people think, what other people are gonna say? I, hear me today, church, I don't wanna be someone who's so concerned about other people's opinions, I'm only concerned about one opinion. I'm only concerned about one person's comments. I'm only concerned about what one person has to say. So often I think the church uh, thinks that 
God's promises and God's calls and that when I say yes to God, the moment that I say yes to God, everything, it's gonna be easy for me. I know, I know the 830 service would never think this, uh, but teenagers think this all the time, right? Adults would never think this, but, but this is, let's just say the teenagers think this all the time, that man, you know, I said yes to God and I thought it was gonna, like all my problems were gonna go away. I thought it was gonna get easy. How many know that saying yes to God is not easy? It's not easy. It's an easy decision to make to say yes to God, but it's not easy. Let's make this announcement this morning. Following God is not easy. Following God is not safe, but following God is the best place for you to be. Let's also make it clear that not following God, not easy, right? It's not easy. Why does God make it where it's not easy? Because this, if it was easy, you would think you could do it on your own. If it was easy, you would think, I don't need God for this. But when it's not easy, when we learn to rely on God, when we learn to lean on God, when we learn to follow God, we see that he is El Shaddai. He is God Almighty. It's not easy. It's not safe. I think too often people miss what God's calling to them, what God's speaking to them, the promises God's giving them, because they are just saying, oh, I'm just waiting to get a word from God that I like. I don't like that that one. I'm waiting to get a word from God that I like. That seems good. Hear me, if you're waiting to get a word from God that you like, you're probably gonna be waiting forever, right? A little Sandlot reference for you. You're gonna be waiting forever. You might just be sitting there going, ah, I don't like this one, I'm gonna wait for a new, no. It's not about a word that you like. It's not about it being easy. It's not about it being safe. What is God speaking to you? I believe there's some people in the room today and God's speaking some things to you. He's speaking to you to switch to that job. He's speaking to you to go into missions. He's speaking you to go talk to that person. He's speaking you to give a certain amount of money. And you're too concerned about what does this do for me? You're too concerned about what are people gonna think? What are people gonna say when I do this? Stop worrying about other people's opinions, other people's comments. Stop worrying about your own logic. If God speaks it, then I'm saying I'm walking it out. I'm going to walk out what God speaks to me. It doesn't make sense when God calls us to stuff. There's never going to be a moment that God speaks something to you and go, yeah, that's, that seems to make, I'm just going to do this, this, and this, and it's all going to fall into place. It's going to be easy. No, God doesn't speak easy things to us. Think about uh, Noah and the ark. It's going to rain. What? It's going to rain. What? You, I, you need me to build a boat? What, a boat for rain? What is this that you're talking about, God? David and Goliath, a boy fighting a giant who's trained in battle, doesn't make sense. Mary, a virgin having a baby, doesn't make sense. Not easy. Jonah, you want me to go talk to those people, God? You want me to go there? It doesn't make sense. God's not gonna call us to a place that makes sense to us. God's not gonna give you a promise that seems easy to you. It causes us to rely on God. Let's be people who have our eyes turned, who are not afraid of what God's speaking to us because he is El Shaddai, he is God Almighty. If he gave you a promise, he's sticking to his promise. So God makes this covenant with him. It's a, it's a two person deal. He says, this is what I'm gonna do for you. And then we're about to see him say, this is what I want you to do in return. Verse nine, then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant you and your descendants after you for generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. I just wanna say thank you to Pastor Austin for giving me this topic this morning. What do we say about following God? It's not easy, right? Following God isn't easy. So here's Abraham at how old is he? 99 years old. At 99 years old, God says, this is what I'm gonna do for you. And I need you to get circumcised. Following God isn't what? It isn't easy. It doesn't always make sense to us. I bet Abraham's going, you want me to do what, God? You want all the men to do what, God? That's gonna be a tough sell to all those guys, God. That's gonna be a tough, it's not easy. It's not just this thing that makes sense to us. Oh yeah, this makes, this is easy for me to do. No, it causes us to say, God's speaking to me, I'm walking it out. And what we're gonna see with Abraham is that on the other side of his obedience, on the un- other side of not understanding why he has to do this thing, but obeying and following God, on the other side of the obedience is a blessing from God. 
Church, on the other side of your obedience, there's a blessing. On the other side of your obedience, you're gonna see that God is faithful. Verse 15, God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her new name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed, said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? It doesn't make sense, it's not easy. Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? We see that God not only changes worship team, you can come. God not only changes Abram's name to Abraham, but he changes Sarai's name to what? Sarah. What's he adding in each of these names? He's adding an H. There's an H. Uh, As long as you brush your teeth this morning, would you help me? And just make the sound of an H for me. Not say an H, make the sound of an H. Let's let's get hooked on phonics, 830 service. (sighs) (sighs) Say it with me. Some of you need breath mint, that's okay. (laughs) He adds a H, it goes from Abram to Abraham. Sarai to Sarah. What is that sound? It's, It's the sound of a breath. God's breathing new life into them. God's breathing a new identity into them. He says, you were once known as Abram, you were once known as Sarah, I'm gonna breathe into you and now new identity. Now you're Abraham, now you're Sarah. There's someone in the room this morning, I feel that, that God wants to breathe new identity into you. That you've come in and whether it's names you've put on yourself or names that the world has put on you, identities that they've said because of a sin, because of a cycle, because of things that you've done, there's been titles that you've been given and God's saying, I don't want that to be your name. That's not your title. I'm giving you new purpose. I'm giving you new identity. I'm breathing new life into you. Man, what? What a good God, a grace-filled God that how many times have we read over the last few weeks that Abram and Sarah, that they make bad decisions, that they lie, that they disobey, that they do this, yet God still says, I don't want you to stay where you're at, I wanna give you something more. He breathes new life into them. And then it says that Abraham falls on the ground and he begins laughing. God, this doesn't make any, I'm almost 100 years old. Sarah's 90 years old. This doesn't make sense. I I don't understand what, what you're saying here, God. Hear me, church, this is faith. This is faith. That God speaks something and I don't understand it. God speaks something and it doesn't make sense to me, but if God spoke it, I'm gonna walk it out. That is faith. Romans chapter four, I love the New Testament, gives us a summary of basically what's happening in Abraham's life. Romans chapter four, verse 18, it says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. I hope that that's us today, church. That I'm not wavering through, I'm not dealing with unbelief that if God promised it, I'm believing it. I'm not weakening in my faith, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Verse 21, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification, to be made blameless, to be justified. It isn't for Abraham alone, it's it's for us. God doesn't just have promises. We see that God doesn't just speak in the Old Testament, doesn't just do stuff in the New Testament, that God's speaking, that God's moving, that God has something for you even today. It's for us, it's for you that we would follow that. I I wonder how many people this morning, when I had you open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 17, you opened it up and you saw the header there of the covenant of circumcision. You thought to yourself, like I thought when 
I heard that I'm preaching on Genesis 17 going, what am I gonna do with this one? But we see that this covenant is referenced in uh, Romans chapter two by Paul and, and he talks about these Jews at this time and, and they made it a big deal that there was this outward thing that they were doing of, of getting circumcised. Then they were, they were really like praising each other of, oh man, you're so good that you did this here. You're so good that you're following God and doing this. But Paul calls them out and says, the outside doesn't reflect what's going on on the inside. What we see is that the Jews, they were doing something just as going through the motions. They were doing something just to look good. Today in the church, here's what that looks like. It looks like uh, communion. It can look like baptism. It can look like church attendance. None of these things are bad. All of these things are really good. But if those are the things that are defining your faith and your walk with God, that's not it. So Paul says, no, actually what it is, is it's a circumcision of the heart. It's a changing of the heart. It's not just about the outside, it's what's going on on the inside. This is saying yes to Jesus. This is being obedient and following God, the one who, who sent his son Jesus to die on a cross, that we would say yes to him and we'd be justified. It's a circumcision of the heart, it's being justified. What we see here, church, today is this, is that God gives a covenant, our response is obedience. God gives a promise, our response is faith. I wonder how many people in the room today, God spoke something to you, God's called something to you, and today maybe for the first time you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna obey this. Okay, I'm gonna be obedient, I've been running from it. Maybe God spoke something to you 10, 20, maybe God spoke something to you 40 years ago, and you've been running from it, you've been avoiding it because, well, what are people gonna think? Or, well, that doesn't seem profitable, that doesn't seem like it makes that much sense. You know what didn't make sense is 99 years old and you gotta get circumcised doesn't make sense but if God says it we're gonna obey it I'm walking it out it's not gonna be easy but I'm gonna walk it out and if God's promised you something I'm praying today and we're gonna pray in just a moment that there's some people in the room that God's promised you something God's shown you something there's some people in the room and your faith is about to rise up this morning faith for things that seem impossible. There's some people in the room today and I've just been feeling as I was praying for this service that there's some children and there's some grandchildren who once were following God and have sinned straight away. And today your faith is gonna rise up again. Today you're gonna be reminded that we serve El Shaddai. We serve God Almighty who can do all things. And we're gonna pray for that. There's some people in the room and your faith's gonna rise up as maybe you've received a diagnosis. You've been sick with something, the doctors have said something, and faith's gonna rise up that God Almighty, that He can heal you. That He can do what doctors can't do, that He can do what they say is impossible. He is the God of the impossible. Do you stand with me all across the room this morning? Here's what I wanna do before we even get into a moment of of responding for faith, of responding, saying, I'm gonna be obedient. And this wasn't planned, so Pastor Austin, if you feel a different route for a song, you go there right as you feel. But I wanna just take a moment, and like Abraham, that when he enters into the presence, when the presence of God falls, that, that he falls face down. I want us just to practice this for just a moment of, of true worship to God of response to him as, as he's here and he's speaking and he's moving that we would get ourselves to a place right now that we would say, I'm gonna worship him. I'm gonna worship, you might not feel like it right now, but you're gonna say, I'm gonna worship him. And maybe you don't know what to sing and maybe you just cry out like the angels, holy, holy, holy is God. But can we just set our hearts on him right now so the band just begins to play something behind. And can you, wherever you're at, can you just begin to worship God? Not worship him like you're going through a motion of, of just doing this again on a Sunday morning, but worship him like, like Abraham when, when he finds, when he's in the presence of God and God finds him in this place that he falls face down, that we would be people that respond to the one who's given us everything. Can we give him our attention right now? Can we give him our focus right now? Come on, church, just begin to worship him right now. up the ground of all my religion, of all the traditions. This is what Romans 2 is referring to. It was religion and tradition that 
Everybody gets circumcised, and that's what everybody was praising. That that's what was happening. But now it's saying, your way is better. It's, it's not the outside, it's the inside. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, if there's someone in the room today and you'd say, I've made it more about religion, I've made it more about tradition, I've gotten so caught up in just these are the things that I do and these are the things that I have to say and this is where I have to go, that this is what I have to do. But today you're saying, I, I've forgotten about who it's really about. I've forgotten about what he's really doing in me. It's not just about what I'm doing on the outside, it's about what's going on, on the inside. And today you wanna to say, Pastor Zach, like Paul talks about, it's time that I have a circumcision of the heart. It's time that something changes in my heart. And it's not maybe that you have walked away from God. You've actually been right there doing all these things. But today you want to remind yourself that it's about what's going on, on the inside. And maybe what you found is that there's anger that has been swelling up. There's unforgiveness that has been there. Things that haven't been seen. There's, there's comparison that's there. There's a judgmental spirit that's there. And you say, God, make me new, make me fresh, make me like you, God. Remove it, God, that I'll be justified. If that's you this morning, no one look around you to say, that's me, Pastor Zach. Shake up the grounds of the tradition of the religion. I want it all about my heart. I want to change and I want to follow him from the inside out. That's you. Would you just raise your hand saying, that's me. See your hands, yes. God, I pray for these hands going up right now. God, I thank you for honesty. I thank you for just this outward expression of this inward decision that they're making, God. And I pray that right now as a church, as these people that raise their hand, God, that we would be people who are changed from the inside, that we would have a heart that is after you, that it wouldn't just be about tradition or religion, that those things are good, but those things aren't God, and that our focus will be on who you really are. We thank you for that, God. Today, I believe that there's some people in the room that God's speaking to you something, that God's calling you to something. Maybe it's something that God called to you a long time ago, and it's maybe something you've been walking out, but maybe it's not a full walk out, or maybe you're just saying, I want to begin to walk it out again, or I want to recommit. You've been walking it out, and you're saying, I want to recommit, saying, God, I'm going to continue this walk. I'm going to continue obeying. And today, I want to invite you to respond, just saying, God, I, I'm responding, saying, I'm going to be obedient to you. That like Abraham, you called him to something difficult. You called him to something that didn't seem easy. You, you made this covenant, and I want to walk in obedience to you. There's some people in the room today, and your faith needs to rise up. And in just a moment, I'm going to invite you down. Whether you're responding, just saying, I want to set my heart on him. You're responding, saying, I want to walk in obedience. You're responding, saying, I need faith to rise up. But in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to the altars, and we're just going to spend some time praying. We're going to spend some time just worshiping God. God, I thank you that you're a holy God. Holy, holy are you, God. That there is none like you, there is none compared to you. There is no person, no thing greater than you. That you are El Shaddai, that you are God Almighty. I thank you that we can trust in you. I thank you that we have your whole word to go back to see that you have been faithful from the beginning and you've been faith, you'll be faithful until the end, God. I pray that today, that in this room, there be faith that rises up, faith that rises up for that grandparent, faith that rises up for that parent, for that spouse, faith that rises up for that, for that son, for that daughter, God. I pray that faith would rise up today for health, God, for, for healings, for miracles, God. I pray faith would rise up for revival in the city, God. God, we want it, we, we ask and we seek, God, we're praying for it today, God, that you would move in this place. God, we say yes to you. We're saying we're making room for you, that if you wanna call me to something, I pray for the person, for the oldest person in this room, that if you call them to something, that like Abraham, our response would be to walk it out in obedience. We say yes to you, God. We worship you in your name, we pray. Amen, if that's you, church, you're saying, I'm gonna be obedient to whatever God speaks to me. I'm listening, God, are you speaking to me? You're saying, I need faith to rise up. You're saying, I wanna just worship God. I just wanna be in his presence. That's you, I invite you to come down. Let's seek his face, let's worship him this morning. God, we worship you. Holy are you, God. If God says it, he's faithful. He makes the covenant, he makes the promise, he's, he's holding up his another deal. What's our response? Our response to a covenant is obedience. Our response to a promise is that we have faith. I pray today that as you leave this place today, that your faith would continue to rise up. I pray that as you, as you leave this place today, that it wouldn't, you wouldn't be concerned about what do people think? What are people gonna say when I walk this out? But if God said it, I'm only concerned about his opinion. I'm walking out in faith.
I'm doing this thing. We serve a God that's faithful, amen. amen. Jesse was reminding me that when God makes a covenant, he's not like us where we start to think, how do I get out of this? How do, I, I'm sure when God spoke this to Abraham, he's going, okay, what? Maybe he doesn't mean literally, maybe he means, you know, and he starts coming with all these excuses. I think of all the times of, times that I've like promised God or I've gone to do something where maybe it's like fasting and you get to like day four of the fast, and you're like, ah, you know, maybe God spoke to me everything he needs to speak to me and I can just go ahead and eat again now, right? That's not God though. When God makes the covenant, when God makes the promise, he's saying, I'm in it. I don't even think about changing it, I'm in it. Be reminded of that today, that we serve a God who is faithful, a God who sees you, a God who's speaking, a God who's moving. I love you, church. I pray you'd have a blessed day. Come back tonight as we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into this chapter. There's water baptisms happening tonight. It's gonna be an exciting night. The offering buckets are up here for the dollar blessing for the food pantry. You can drop your giving in there. Have a blessed day. Go jump in on a Sunday school class. We love you.